family cabin had been in our possession for decades. A tucked away relic in the dense Missouri wilderness, far from the nearest town, off the grid in the truest sense of the word. It was my grandpa's pride and joy, a two-story hunting retreat with creaky wooden floors and the faint smell of smoke from years and years of stove fires. No electricity, no running water, just a generator for a couple of lights in the fridge and a well pump for drinking water. Trips up there varied in purpose. Sometimes it was for hunting, other times it was just for family reunions where everybody would pile in, make a mess, and leave grandpa cursing under his breath for weeks afterwards. It was our little slice of wilderness, a place where the outside world did not intrude. This time it was just supposed to be me and Damien. We'd both been working our asses off in the city, decided we both needed a break. Just some time away, a couple of days to do nothing but drink beer and maybe hike a little bit, whittle on some sticks, shoot at some tin cans. We'd done it a million times before, sometimes for fun and sometimes because we were already in the area for work and just needed a place to crash. That cabin always delivered on peace and quiet. We got the green light from the family and nobody else had booked it for that weekend, so it was ours. We packed our coolers full of beer, threw some jerky and sandwiches into a bag, and made sure that we had everything we'd need to just unwind, or at least so we thought. The cabin was about an hour away from the main highway, tucked behind miles of dirt roads and through a thick winding forest. Even with GPS, most people would not be able to find it. Hell, I'm sure if somebody did, they'd still have to get past the gate, which was pure steel. We arrived mid-afternoon, and that place had not changed since the last time we were there, still standing sturdy, but looking like it was slowly losing that battle the time. The porch was covered in a thin layer of leaves, and the front door creaked when we opened it. Inside, the musty smell hit us immediately. It was kind of a mix between mildew and aged wood. Damien wrinkled his nose. It smells like uh, nature's asshole in here. It's better than the city's asshole. I shot back. We spent the next hour or so settling in, unpacking the truck, grabbing the beers, and getting some music going. Damien and I had this tradition of blasting whatever rock album that we were into at the time, letting the forest know that we both arrived. It felt good to unwind. Sitting on the porch, watching the light filter through the trees, the sun started to dip. It's beautiful. There's just a quiet out here that you can't find anywhere else. No cars, no people. Just the occasional chirp of a bird or a rustle of leaves. It was the kind of silence that was almost too perfect. The kind that made you feel like the world had forgotten about you. We were around halfway through that six pack when Damien brought up about the shooting range out back. We had a few targets still set up down near the tree line. It was our usual tradition to blow off some steam by plinking at them with whatever guns we brought with us. Did you bring a rifle? I asked, sipping at my beer. Damien shook his head. Ah, I thought you were bringing them. I groaned. I didn't bring shit, dude. Well, there's an old BB gun inside, Damien said with a grin. We can shoot the cans with that, right? We both laughed, a little disappointed, but figured we'd just make do with what we got. As the day started to wind down, we shot a couple of cans off the porch with that BB gun. Honestly, it was more fun than we expected it to be. The sun was now low, casting long shadows across the yard as we started cleaning up the porch. That's when we heard something moving out in the trees. I literally stopped mid-conversation and Damien froze too, his hand still half crushing the beer can. We both looked out toward the tree line, 50 yards away, where the thick woods swallowed up everything inside the darkness. You hear that? I asked. Damien just nodded. Yeah. That wasn't a small animal. Whatever it was, it was pretty big shoving through the underbrush like it owned the place. We stood there, squinting out into the darkness, waiting for something to appear. A deer maybe, bear if we were really unlucky. That kind of animal could mess you up if you weren't careful. I grabbed the flashlight off the porch railing, aimed it at the trees, 
sweeping it back and forth, but didn't see anything. Just the sound of whatever it was moving further away, crunching through the brush like it was in no hurry to get anywhere else. Damien let out a breath after that. Phew. Uh, probably a deer? Yeah, I agreed. But it didn't sit right with me. Deer didn't move like that. They were quick, skittish, always darting around like something was chasing them, even if it wasn't. That noise, that thing, it moved slow and deliberately, like it wasn't scared of us or anything else. We shrugged it off and just went back inside, turned the music up a notch, and set up for a game of beer pong. That was our tradition. Every time we came out here, we had to play at least one match. We lined up the cups, grabbed a ball, and got ready to get wrecked. About halfway through that game, Damien had just sunk a shot when we heard something hit the side of the cabin, hard. It was almost like a goddamn battering ram. The whole side of the house shook, and for a split second, I assumed a car had literally ran into the building. Both of us froze, ping pong ball still bouncing across the table. Then it happened again. Bam! The wall shaking so hard I thought they were going to give out. Jesus! Damien shouted, dropping his beer and standing up. The hell is that? I didn't have an answer for him. We just stared at one another, waiting for one more crash, but this time to actually come through the wall. But nothing did. The cabin was still intact, but the noise had now stopped, and the silence that followed it was deafening. I felt Damien's eyes on me, waiting for me to make the first move. Without saying another word, we both started locking everything up. There was no plan, and no real communication was needed. This wasn't our first time out in the middle of nowhere. We've had bear scares before, so we knew the drill. Lock the doors, close the windows, and hope whatever that is goes away. But bears don't slam into buildings like that. I peeked out the front window, shining a flashlight across the yard. Nothing, just the darkness outside, rippling to the breeze. Damien appeared beside me. Think it's gone? I shook my head, not really knowing what to think or what to say. Whatever hit the cabin wasn't just some animal. It had too much weight behind it, too much intent. We had no choice but to just keep waiting. The minutes ticked by and eventually that fear turned into frustration. We needed to know what the hell was out there. Damien grabbed a pocket knife from the kitchen drawer and I followed suit, grabbing my flashlight as well. We gotta check this out, he muttered. We can't just sit here all night not knowing, man. Reluctantly, I agreed. We stepped out onto the porch, shining our lights toward the driveway. There was nothing out there, no sign of an animal or anything else. But as we walked toward that tree line, something caught my eye. I stopped and gripped my knife even tighter. Hey, wait, I whispered, barely even able to speak. There just beyond the edge of the light was a figure, tall, gaunt, and standing unnervingly still. Before either of us could react or say anything, it moved. Now, it didn't walk or run. It zigzagged, darted from side to side like some kind of rabid animal, making these weird guttural noises. It was like watching somebody move on fast forward, just completely unhinged. Shit, Damien yelled, stumbling backward. My heart started racing in my chest as we both turned and bolted back to the cabin. We slammed the front door behind us and further reinforced it, chairs from the kitchen, just in case. Then we took the long kitchen table, flipped it on its side, and skirted it up so it would block the big window. My hands were shaking as I peeked out one last time. The figure stood outside of range of the porch light, watching. He was really tall with long scraggly hair. His face was pale and expressionless. It's almost like some kind of twisted looking ghost. I don't know really how else to explain it. Then just as quickly as he appeared, he slunk back into the shadows, vanishing into the thick tree line. 
What the fuck was that? Damien whispered. Obviously, I had no answer for him. Didn't even want to think about it. All I knew was that we were not safe here. Not at all, and not tonight. We barricaded ourselves upstairs in the loft, where we could see the driveway through a small window. But there was no more movement, no more sounds, just the faint creak of the wind against the walls. But we knew that figure was still out there, watching, waiting. We huddled up with our knives, flashlights, and a BB gun, desperate for that night to come to an end. Honestly, we brought the beers up there too, anything to calm our nerves in the moment, right? Eventually, we started talking, trying to make sense of what had just taken place. Whoever or whatever was out there had to have come up that long dirt road. There were signs posted everywhere and a massive I-beam gate at the entrance. It's private property. No one should be out here unless they had a good reason to be. And that reason, it didn't seem like anything good. By the time the sun had crept up over the trees, neither of us slept even for a minute. We stayed perched in the loft, eyes bloodshot, ears straining for any hint of movement outside. The figure had not returned, or at least from what we'd seen, but that unease continued to linger. When daylight finally came, it was a relief, but also a stark reminder that we couldn't stay locked up forever, and Damien was the first to bring it up. We need to get out of here, now. I nodded in agreement, my mind already running through the quickest way to get to the truck. We really didn't have much gear to pack, just the essentials. We could be on the road in less than 10 minutes if we moved fast enough. But there was still the issue of that figure. Was he still out there? Was he still watching? Or had he left after toying with us all night? We cautiously descended the loft. Damien had the BB gun clutched tight in one hand, like it could offer any kind of real protection. All the while, I gripped the flashlight and my pocket knife. As if those flimsy defenses would make any kind of difference if we actually ran into that thing again. We packed our shit up, scarfed down a quick breakfast, and gave everything a surface level cleaning. As we opened up the door to the cabin, the morning light washed over the yard and painted everything in this eerie calm. The leaves rustled gently in the wind and the air felt cooler than it had the night before. For a brief moment, it seemed like the nightmare might have been just that, a bad dream that had taken advantage of the dark and our overactive imaginations. But then I noticed the tracks, they were unmistakable, imprinted in the soft soil just a few feet from the cabin, large, uneven footprints, too big to be human, but too irregular to be an animal. Some of the impressions were deep, like whatever had made them was dragging something heavy. They led off toward the tree line, disappearing into the shadowy depths of the forest where that figure had vanished hours before. What the hell, dude? Damien muttered, stepping closer to inspect them. I pulled him back. Don't. Let's just get to the truck. We didn't need to know where those tracks led. All I knew was that they weren't something we should follow. Whatever had been out there last night wasn't natural, and I personally didn't want to find out more than we already had. We hurried to the truck, our eyes constantly scanning the edge of the woods. There was no sign of movement, no hint of that figure, but the hairs on the back of my neck stayed standing, almost like some unseen eyes were fixed on us that whole time. Every sound, the crunch of our boots, the slam of the truck doors, felt unnaturally loud, like we were disturbing something that was still lingering out there in the shadows. We got around to the side of the building and stopped dead in our tracks. The door to the truck was hanging wide open. Papers and all kinds of stuff lay scattering to the wind. We ran up and peeked inside. Empty, but it was totally ransacked. It all came together. The dude outside was some asshole in the woods, probably followed our truck all the way here and decided to rob us. When we came outside, he got all crazy to scare us back inside, at which point we locked ourselves within. The cash in the glove box, the change in the cup holder, the random stuff from the back seat, all gone. Typical tweaker activity. It wasn't some paranormal ghoul, 
a backwoods meth head. Damien fired up the engine, and as soon as it roared to life, we just peeled out of the driveway, kicking up a cloud of dust as we sped down the dirt road. I didn't look back. I couldn't. I just focused on the road ahead, praying we'd make it out of those woods without seeing that guy or anyone else. The drive was tense, silent. Neither of us were even speaking, but I could see Damien's hand shaking on the steering wheel, though I'm assuming it was probably mostly from sheer exhaustion. Every bump, every turn in the road felt like a threat. Even when we finally hit the highway, it didn't feel safe. I kept checking the rearview mirror, half expecting to see that dude trailing behind us, somehow keeping pace. We didn't stop until we were miles away, back in town in the middle of broad daylight. When Damien finally pulled into a gas station, we both just sat there for a moment, catching our breath. The tension in my chest had loosened slightly, but my heart was still racing. Okay, what, what do you think that was? Damien asked, breaking the silence finally. His voice was shaky and I could see his hands that were trembling inside of his lap. I quickly spilled out my junkie theory, which he nodded along with. It made sense, especially if you know the area we're in. I guess, maybe, I don't know, man, he said. But I do know one thing, I'm not going back there anytime soon. Now it was my turn to nod along. Yeah. Yeah, same. We sat there for a few more minutes, letting the reality of the night sink in. We made calls to both the family and the local police department. Grandpa said he'd go check it out with Uncle Jimmy, and the police said they'd also send somebody out to take a look. To this day, we don't know what slammed into the side of the cabin, but Grandpa found clear indents pretty high up on the side wall of the building. He asked a bunch of questions at first, but the more he investigated, the further he got away from any really solid answers. The guy just straight up disappeared. We didn't talk about that night again either, after the buzz went away. Not to our families, not to our friends. It was just one of those unspoken things. A shared nightmare that lingered at the edge of our mind. I was just too terrified to confront head on. We don't go to that cabin on solo trips anymore either. Monica and I have been talking about this trip for years now. We wanted something special, something that would stand out as an adventure that we could talk about when we were older, settled down and surrounded by the everyday grind. The idea of being off the grid and out in the wilderness where it was just us two in complete solitude sounded like a dream. When we finally managed to save up enough money, we booked up this long stay inside the northern wilderness of Ontario a place so remote that it nearly took a full day's drive just to reach the cabin that we'd rented out. The company that we rented from had this collection of A-frame cabins scattered all over the region. They were rustic, minimalist, the kind of place where the only source of heat would come from a wood-burning stove. Some of these cabins didn't even have running water. Monica loved it, and to be honest, I did too. It was like something out of this adventure novel and we were finally gonna live it for ourselves. When we first pulled up to the cabin, it was everything that we were hoping for. A small, triangular structure with these wide windows that faced out into the endless forest. No neighbors, no sounds except for the wind in the trees and the soft rush of a stream somewhere nearby. We were completely surrounded by towering trees, their thick trunks making it feel like we were cut completely off from the rest of the world. The air was crisp, clean, totally unmarred. Oh, this is perfect, Monica said, stepping out of the car with a wide grin on her face. Her breath misted in the air as she stretched her arms out, embracing the isolation around us. I couldn't help but smile too. It was perfect. It was exactly what we wanted. Isolated, romantic, and a little rough around the edges, but here it was. 
cabin itself was pretty basic but charming. A small bedroom, a kitchen that had just enough space for a two burner stove, and this tiny little fridge. A living room that doubled as a dining area. There was a fireplace stocked with dry wood, a single faucet that pumped cold water from a nearby well, and a narrow porch that wrapped around the front. The management company had been true to their word. No frills, no fancy amenities, just us and nature. We spent that whole first day exploring the area, walking along the stream, taking pictures of the trees and the distant mountains. It literally felt like we were in a postcard. As the sun started to set, we headed back to the cabin, giddy from the fresh air and the feeling of being so completely removed from everything else. We brought a few bottles of wine with us, nothing fancy, just enough to celebrate our escape from the real world. That night we cooked a simple pasta dish, the kind of thing that we made a hundred times before, but somehow it just tasted better here, inside the quiet of the woods, with only the crackle of the fire and the occasional chirp of the crickets to break out the silence. After dinner, we cleaned up the kitchen and took the wine to the bedroom, intending to finish the day in the best way possible, together with nobody to interrupt us. But just as we started to relax, a sound shattered that peace. Faint at first, like the creak of old wood just settling. I paused, glanced over at Monica, who had already started to undress. Did you hear that? I said. She frowned. Hear what? There it was again, this time louder. The unmistakable sound of footsteps. Slow, deliberate, moving across the porch just outside the cabin. The floorboards creaked underneath the weight, and I felt the vibrations through those very thin walls around us. Monica froze. Her eyes were now wide, her shirt still halfway off. Someone's out there, she whispered to me. My first thought was, it has to be the owner, right? I mean, maybe they were stopping by to check if we had arrived, or maybe just to ensure that everything was in order, but why now? It was so late, nearly nine at night. And why didn't they knock? I slipped out of bed with my heart pounding and I crept over to the window. I peeked out through the curtains, scanned the porch and the yard beyond. Nothing, not a single sign of any movement. But that sound had been so clear, so distinct. I could have sworn that there was somebody out there. I then moved to the door, quietly unlocked it before pulling it open just a crack. The cool night air rushed in, sending a shiver down my spine. I stepped out onto the porch, my bare feet cold against that wood. Boot prints. Fresh, muddy boot prints led right up to the front door and then stopped. There was no other signs or tracks of somebody walking away. I quickly shut the door and locked it again. Monica was sitting up against a bed, her face pale. What was it? What'd you see? I swallowed hard. Footprints. Somebody was definitely here. Is there anybody out there now? I shook my head. No, but I don't know where they went. We spent the next hour debating amongst each other whether we should even leave or stay or what. Monica was clearly spooked and honestly, so was I. But the more we talked, the more we convinced ourselves that maybe it wasn't as sinister as it seemed. Maybe somebody got lost or was just passing through, got mixed up with cabins. There's a lot of hiking trails in the area and the management company did mention that sometimes people wander near the cabin by mistake. In the end, we decided to stay. We paid way too much, planned way too long to let this strange occurrence ruin our trip entirely. Besides, whoever it was, they seem to be gone now. We tried calling the management company, but the service was spotty out here. Our email didn't go through either. With no way to reach anybody, we decided to just let it go. The next day, everything felt normal again. We spent that morning fishing in the stream, laughing at our lack of skills, and then later in the afternoon, we discovered this small cave system nearby. 
We didn't venture too far inside, but we found evidence of other people had been in there. Old ropes, some shoe prints in the dirt. It gave us a strange sense of comfort, like we weren't entirely alone out here. Even though after last night, the thought of somebody being in the area also made my skin crawl a little. That evening, as the sun began to set, the weather turned colder. We huddled in the cabin, cooked some dinner, drank some more wine, and listened to music on the small Bluetooth speaker that we brought along with us. For a while, everything was perfect again. But as that night wore on, the shadows outside seemed to grow darker. That creeping sense of unease returned. By the time we made it back to the bedroom and tried to get at it again, the cabin felt too quiet. We tried to distract ourselves, kissing and undressing and trying to get back to the intimacy that we'd lost the night before, but we didn't get too far before we heard it once again. Footsteps. This time they were louder, heavier, moving slowly across the porch. I stopped and held my breath and looked at Monica. She was staring at the door, her eyes wide with fear. Without thinking, I got up and went to the bedroom door, peeking around the frame. And that's when I saw the front door slowly creaking open. My blood turned to ice. Two figures dressed in dark clothes slipped silently through the doorway. They moved with purpose, not hesitating, casually looking around. One of them headed for the kitchen, the other towards the living room. I backed up and shut the bedroom door as quietly as I could and locked it. My hands were now shaking so badly, I could barely even turn the latch. This was fucking crazy. Nothing I'd ever prepared myself for. And the exact kind of shit I'd come out here to get away from. The hell are these guys? What is it? Monica whispered. There's people in the cabin. I whispered back. Two men, they just came in. She gasped, covering her mouth with one of her hands, and I shook my head and tried to communicate that we needed to be as quiet as possible. We need to get out of here, I said, mind racing. We'll go through the window. If we get to the car, we're good. Before we could make a move, though, we heard footsteps again, this time moving throughout the common room, the main space, otherwise known as the right spot outside of our bedroom door. Then the creak of the bathroom door opening. I could hear the faint clink of our toiletry bag being moved around, as if those intruders were inspecting every detail of our lives. My stomach turned and I felt a cold sweat break out on my skin. There was an odd sound then, some kind of shuffling, maybe like physical gestures and then complete silence. I saw in my mind's eye these two guys making hand signs at each other to communicate that yes, somebody's inside the house. It was dawning on me. These people weren't expecting anybody to be here. Then, just as suddenly as they came in, the footsteps retreated. The door squeaked as it closed, and the silence that followed was nauseating. I actually thought they were doing that age-old trick of pretending to leave, pretending to walk away, doing those fake footsteps, closing the door just to see if we'd come out. Then they'd kill us without too much drama. I felt like I was about to puke and only wanted to protect Monica. I waited, holding my breath, listening for any signs that they might still be out there. All I could hear was the distant sound of the wind in the trees. Slowly and cautiously, I crept over to the window and peered out. I could just make out those two figures moving throughout the woods, heading north and disappearing out in the darkness. We didn't waste any more time. Monica and I packed up our things as quickly and as quietly as we could, stuffing everything into bags without caring even if we forgot something. We just needed to get out. We ran to the car, barely daring to breathe until we were back on the dirt road, speeding away from that cabin. As we drove, I glanced back in the rearview mirror, expecting to see them following, but the road behind was empty. Then, just as we were about to reach the main highway, I saw it. Far off in the distance, a flicker of a firelight, a camp, one that hadn't been there before. Monica saw it too. The hell is that? She said. I don't know. I returned, but we're not sticking around to find out. 
We finally made it back to civilization. Called that management company and told them everything. They promised to look into it and send somebody out to check the property, but something in their voice made me think they'd heard this kind of thing before. The whole response felt sterile and fake. Money refunded, a voucher for a free stay, that kind of thing. I hung up the phone, feeling a strange mix of relief as well as dread. The woman on the other end of that line, it just sounded so calm, too calm, like what we described wasn't out of the ordinary. We sat in the car parked at this roadside diner, the neon sign flickering above us. The hum of traffic and bright lights of the town felt like a world away from the cabin, but the unease was still clinging to me, like smoke that you couldn't wash off. Monica was the first to break the silence. What if they were waiting for us to leave? What if they've done this before? I wanted to say it's a one-time thing, that we were just those unlucky people, that the wilderness was just full of weirdos, you know, whatever it was. But I couldn't shake the feeling that something darker was at play. I don't know. I don't have any answers. I finally said, staring out at the highway. But we're not going back. We'll figure something else out. We ended up sitting in that diner for hours, going over every detail of the past two nights, trying to make sense of it all. They didn't steal anything. They just came in, walked through the cabin, then left. It didn't feel like a robbery. It felt like something else. Trafficking, maybe. Still, being so deep into Canada, I didn't even know this kind of thing went on here. By the time we drove home, we were exhausted and jittery. We just tried to let it all go. We talked less and less about the trip in the days that followed, burying that experience under work and our routine. But there were things that wouldn't leave my mind, images that resurfaced about that night when the house was quiet. Those boot prints on the porch, the front door creaking open, the figures moving silently through our cabin as if they belonged there. Weeks later, I received a voicemail from that same management company. The tone of the woman's voice was different this time, serious, clipped. She explained the cabin had been checked. There was no signs of forced entry. They found our report unsettling, but ultimately inconclusive. The cabin would still be available for future guests, and they assured me they tightened up on security, whatever that means. I deleted the voicemail without even responding. It just felt like a dismissal, a way to brush off what had happened like we were just another pair of skittish tourists. But then a few months later, I stumbled across this news article. A couple, hikers from out of state, had gone missing in that same exact region. Their car was found abandoned near the trailhead, not far from where our cabin had been. Their personal belongings were left inside, untouched. The local authorities had not found any leads, but there was speculation about foul play. It seemed like it was one of those tragic, unsolved disappearances that would fade from the headlines in just a few weeks. Except for one small detail. In the article, a photo of the missing couple's car showed something strange. Parked near that abandoned vehicle, just barely in the background, was an old pickup truck. Its bed was filled with camping gear. And standing next to it, though it was blurred and indistinct, were two figures. I stared at that screen for a long time. It was impossible to make out the faces or anything else other than those vague shapes, but something about their posture, their stillness, it felt all too familiar. Monica came into the room, noticing my expression. What is it? She asked, her voice cautious like she almost didn't want to know the answer. I showed her the article, and as she read, her face strained of all color. It's them, she whispered. It has to be, right? We adjusted our bucket list priorities after this trip, as we hoped to never meet anybody like that again. I kept an eye on the area, the case of the missing hikers and the property company for the next few months. And this is what I learned. Those hikers were never seen again, that's a fact. 
foul play is expected, but lack of evidence is still this huge hurdle. What I did also learn about that region, though, was that a number of these cabins that were managed by that property were vandalized over a year's time, with lots of things being stolen and broken. I also learned that same rental company had terminated an employee about six months before our trip, which lined up almost perfectly with the timeline of the break-ins. That same employee disappeared from his rental, broke the contract, and pretty much disappeared from town after being fired. Now, obviously, I don't have all the pieces to link these two incidents together, but in my mind, it has to be related. In 2021, I finally made the move. For years, I dreamt of getting out of the city, away from the crowds, the traffic, the noise. The pandemic had just sealed the deal for me. I decided to stop dreaming and start doing. After some research and scouting, I bought a few acres way out in the boonies, way off the grid. Remote enough that I'd be hard pressed to get any cell service, but still, not too far away from the nearest town that I couldn't stock up on supplies if need be. My plan was to build a cabin, a real off-the-grid setup with solar panels, a water pump, a silo for storing rainwater, and a chicken coop. It was a very ambitious project, but the cabin itself was just a dream at that point. First, I had to clear the land, and that itself was going to take some time. Every weekend, I'd pack up my truck and head out there either by myself or with a buddy. The property was heavily wooded, dense with pines and old oak trees. So the first order of business was clearing out enough space to lay some kind of foundation. I wasn't in a rush. I had the next few years to plan this all, to save some money and chip away at the project. Every Saturday, I'd spend hours bushwhacking through the underbrush, cutting away the tangled vines and thick brush that clung to the forest floor. It was backbreaking work, but it felt good. The air was so clean out there. The silence was only broken by the occasional call of a crow or the rustling of the leaves in the wind. No sirens, no honking, just me in the wilderness. One weekend in the early fall, I headed out there solo. My buddy Alec had plans, so I figured I'd spend the day just clearing some brush, maybe work on the building and get a rough outline of where I wanted to put the actual foundation. I arrived around the property at noon. The sun was already high in the sky. I unloaded my gear and got to work. The hour slipped by in a blur of sweat and sawdust. By the time the sun had started dipping below the tree line, I was beat. My hands were blistered and my back was sore. But I was satisfied with the progress that I'd made. I'd cleared a pretty decent section of the land. I had a rough idea on where the cabin would actually sit. I had originally planned to set up my tent and build a fire, but I was too tired to do either of those. Instead, I grabbed my sleeping bag and unrolled it in the bed of my truck. It was cozy enough. I liked the idea of sleeping underneath the stars, too. I'd packed a couple of sandwiches, a few beers, and my full-size 9mm with me, so it felt secure enough. After all, it wasn't like there was anybody else out here. The nearest road was a good 20 minutes away. I had that property all to myself. At least, that's what I thought. I cracked open one of my beers and settled into the back of my truck, flashlight resting beside me, casting this pale glow onto the trees around. The stars above me were these brilliant pinpricks of light in the dark sky. I let out a long breath and took a swig of my beer, feeling the tension in my muscles slowly ease. And that's when I saw these lights. At first, I thought they were fireflies, tiny specks of light flickering through the trees, but they definitely weren't. These were brighter, way more organized. Flashlights or lanterns had to be one of the two. They were moving in a line, weaving through the trees in the distance. I sat up and squinted out into the dark. I counted out at least ten of them, maybe more. They moved silently, coming from the far side of the property, out past the field. 
The closer they got, the more distinct their shapes had become. People had to be a group of them, walking in a single file, out in the woods and into an open field. I knew my property lines, they weren't on my land, but still, something about all this just did not sit right with me. There's no public roads nearby, there's no hiking trail, what were they doing out here? Curiosity got the better of me. I grabbed my gun and climbed out of the truck, started walking toward them, keeping to the shadows. I got within a hundred feet of them before I stopped. They were all sitting in this loose circle, right in the middle of the field. They weren't talking, at least not that I could hear, but they were all looking up towards the sky. I strained, trying to listen, but all I could hear was the rustling of the wind through the trees. Something about all this was giving me the creeps. I backed away slowly, not wanting to get any closer than I already was. And that's when the weirdest part of it all happened. All of them started chanting, singing some weird song. I really couldn't quite make out the words, too. I thought maybe they were Boy Scouts or Girl Scouts, something of the like, making a midnight march to the forest for this little stargazing and a sing song. But these people were grown ups, and that was the only issue with that theory. Even in the dark, I could see they were fully grown people. Once I got back to my truck, I quietly packed up the rest of my gear, making sure everything was secure. I didn't want to stick around and find out what else was about to happen or what these people were up to. I climbed into the cab, locked the doors, fired up my engine. I didn't turn on the lights at first, just let the engine idle as I kept my eyes on the group. That's when I saw more movement along the tree line. More figures darting between the trees now. My stomach clenched. Switched on the headlights and flooded the field with light. A few of them tore off into the trees, running as soon as my light hit them. I watched them disappear into the woods and then I let my breath out. Everything was seemingly going back to normal. Satisfied that they were now gone, I settled back into the cab, locked the doors every 30 minutes just to be sure. I didn't sleep much that night. Every rustle, every snap of twig had me wide awake, clutching for my gun. The rest of that weekend passed uneventfully. I didn't see another soul, but the memory of those figures in the field stayed with me. I told Alec about it the following week. He agreed it was strange, but figured it was probably some kids messing around or maybe some hippies from another town. Still, he agreed to come out with me the next weekend just to help me keep an eye on things. The weekend rolled around. Alec and I loaded up my truck and headed out to the property. We set up a tight little base camp among the towering pines, hidden from view. We spent that day working, clearing more brush, moving some larger stones out of the way. By the time the sun was setting, we were both exhausted, but eager to see if these strange people would indeed show up again. That night, we ate a cold dinner and cracked open a few beers, talking in low, hushed voices as the darkness enveloped us. We didn't have to wait long. Just as the light faded from the sky, we heard it, a faint rustling, far off in the trees. Alec handed me a pair of binoculars and we watched as the same group of people came walking through the woods once more, flashlights and lanterns in hand. They made their way to the same field, forming that same loose circle. This time, I decided to get closer. We grabbed our pistols and crept through the woods, keeping low and moving as quietly as we could. We got within 40 feet of them, hiding behind a pocket of large oak trees, and from there, we could see them a lot more clearly. They weren't saying anything, just humming, and it wasn't a song. It was more like a low rhythmic hum that reverberated through the night. Alec inched closer, moving from another tree about 30 feet from the group. I stayed where I was. I almost felt like a kid again, like almost sneaking up on my neighbors or spying on the new family across the street. This was never anything I'd done as an adult. Then suddenly, the humming stopped and the group all pointed different colored lights up into the sky clicking them on and off in this mesmerizing pattern. 
The lights blinked in silence, a strange, unsettling rhythm that made my skin crawl in the moment. I couldn't even tell what kind of lights they were at first, just a box with a single lens on it. And then there was a button on the side, and each one was a different shade of yellow, blue, green, or red. Alec was about to return to my side when he misstepped, snapping a branch underneath his foot. That sound echoed throughout the trees. It was so loud and sharp. The group reacted immediately. Half of them sprang to their feet, dropping the lights, and came charging toward us. Alec stumbled and falled into a bush. I ran to help him up. They were on us that quickly. I hadn't even raised my gun. I cursed myself for the mistake as I felt hands grab me, throw me to the ground. Alec was struggling beside me, kicking and punching, trying to get himself free. I managed to shove one of them off of me and rolled onto my back, looking up at the sky. And that's when I saw this red light glowing high above the trees. At first, I thought it was a star or maybe a plane, but it was too close, too bright. It hung there just above the treetops, pulsating like a searing hot piece of metal. When my eyes landed on it, it stopped moving, or at least it seemed to. Then the scuffle got heavy again. Two guys were trying to pin me down. I pushed one off and wrestled with the other, and I could see Alec getting absolutely mauled by the other three. Above us, the light looked down with indifference. I pushed one of the guys off that I was wrestling with and fired a shot into the air. The sound was deafening, and for a moment, everything and everyone stopped. The attackers froze. Alex scrambled to his feet and retrieved his gun. We pointed our weapons at the group, taking a few steps back. They didn't chase us. They were now all staring up at the sky at that red light. Alec whispered to me, Is that a drone? I don't know, I muttered, eyes locked down on the glowing object. It just hovered there, motionless, before slowly drifting upward and disappearing into the night. It was a rippling red and orange, roughly cylinder shaped. It looked to be the size of a couch, but in the dark it was really hard to tell. The group didn't seem scared at all. They were clapping each other on the back, smiling, laughing even, as they scrambled to leave. And we heard one of them shout, it worked. Alec and I just stood there stunned, watching them retreat into the trees. Once they were gone, we checked the area, but nothing was out of place. No sign of their lights or even more chanting. My ears were still ringing from that gunshot though. We walked back to our truck in silence and neither of us spoke until we were halfway down the road. The hell was that? Alec finally said. I shook my head. I, I have no idea. We spent the rest of that night on watch duty, but eventually we both crashed. There weren't any more people, no more lights in the sky. It's a seriously weird encounter. Weird enough that the next morning we just packed up and went home. We wanted to rest and get our heads right before spending any more time out there. And honestly, we were both creeped out. After a few weeks and even talking with the local police, we ended up going back out there. Nothing happened. No people, no lights. It gave me confidence that I was going to start going back alone, though. It's been around three years since that took place. I haven't seen a soul back in the area since. I think the gunfire probably told them whatever they were doing wasn't worth it. I still don't know what they were up to, though, and part of me thinks they were some kind of film students, trying to get a shot of a movie or something, but honestly, I can't be sure. All I know is when I spend the night out there now, I don't spend any time looking at the stars.